Hi, everybody. Whew. I'm back. It's me, Maris Wicks. Um, thank you for joining us today for a live draw and chat. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and what we're going to do today, and then we'll get drawing. So uh, I'm Maris Wicks. I write and draw comic books about science. Uh, I'm the author and illustrator of this book, which is Coral Reefs, Cities of the Ocean. And I also spent eight years as a program educator at the New England Aquarium. So I really like to combine my love of art and my love of science to share cool facts and cool stories about the natural world with you. So the way that I did the research for this book is kind of the same way that you might do research for a book report or a term paper. Um, I read a ton of books. I watched uh, documentaries about coral reefs. And I actually went to the New England Aquarium a lot. The main tank in the New England Aquarium is the giant ocean tank, and it's a Caribbean coral reef habitat. So it gave me a way to observe some of the animals that live in a coral reef without actually having to travel there. Um, but I, I really wanted to visit a coral reef, so I got scuba certified, and I went to the Caribbean as well. Um, but I did my certification dives in the Boston Harbor. It was cold. Um, so the books I have with me today, because you're, you're going to be able to see some photos on the screen, but I'm going to be looking at pictures. I've got a cool reef ID book, which is obviously very loved. Um, these are really fun. They're more animal ID cards and they're waterproof. So waterproof guides, if you're going to the beach in the summer here, it's pretty fun to find plastic ones because you can take them tide pooling or in shallow water, just hold on to them. Um, and I like to learn about the insides and outs. So some of you might have seen eyewitness books. These books are awesome reference books, and they're not just about fish. You can find them on anything. And they're a really cool introduction to kind of the ins and outs of something you might be interested in. So I'm just showing you these because a lot of times I have a lot of references for my drawings that you might not see when I'm drawing. But I'm gonna, we're going to pop up pictures on the screen for you to draw as well. So we're going to focus on four animals today that live in the giant ocean tank at the New England Aquarium. And we might talk about some other animals just because I have a tendency to go on tangents. Um, but before we start drawing, I just have some quick drawing guidelines. Um, I want you to have fun if you're going to draw along with me today. That's number one. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to draw these animals. I'm going to show you how I do it because I think it's really nice when artists share their process. Um, so I want to show you how I do it. And like I said, the way I do it is not right or wrong. It's just how I draw these. Um, and I wanted to let you know that drawing is a skill. I wasn't just born good at drawing. I've been drawing as soon as I can hold a crayon. So that's about, let's see if I can do some math here, about 36 years of experience. Um, I have a bachelor's of fine arts and illustration. You do not have to have a degree to make art, but I did spend four years studying art and drawing. So I like to say this to people because sometimes when you start out doing something, whether you're a young person or an adult, uh, it can be difficult at first to try something new. So think about the first time you ever played an instrument or a sport. Um, all those things take practice and art is the same way. So all the things that you're gonna see, I practice drawing all the time. Like I've drawn hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish uh, over my lifetime. So anyways, uh, let's get started. So grab your pencils and some paper. I'm going to share my screen so you can see what I'm drawing and you can draw along with me. And I'm going to want to put on my headphones too because that will make it a little bit easier for me. So uh, when I cartoon a fish or an animal or anything, I'm looking at kind of these main things on the right hand sides. I want to look at their body shape. I want to look at their fins or limbs. Do those have a shape? Are they long? Are they small? Are they short? What function do they have? So in that case, if I'm looking at a fish, do the fins look like this fish might make it a fast swimmer or a slow swimmer? And we'll talk about that with some of the fish I'm drawing today. Mouth and mouth shape. Does this animal have teeth? Are the teeth pointy? Are they flat for crushing? Last week we drew cow nose rays and cow nose rays are uh, related to sharks. They're cartilaginous fish, but they have flat teeth for crushing their prey like clams and crabs. Um, eyes, what do their eyes look like? Are they big, are they small? Where are they on their body? Patterns, so in this case, I think everybody we're drawing today is a fish. So, um, you know, what do the scale shapes look like? Big scales, little scales, are there colors or dots that make um, 
that animal recognizable and behavior. And this is the one that we can't necessarily get from looking at pictures. So I'm going to share a little bit of my experience observing animals either at the aquarium or, or while I was on dives to talk a little bit about how watching and observing an animal can help me tell you more about it, whether it's the animal looking at prey they're going to eat or hiding from a predator or just navigating the reef. So first one we're going to start with is look downs. So Look downs are a type of schooling fish, um, and pardon me while I get my little look down reference here as well. They are aptly named, and I like to, um, I use common names a lot just because it's a lot easier for my artist brain to remember common names. Science names are really important. I have it, the scientific name for look downs here on the screen. Um, but in my case, I use common names just because it's helpful for me to, to uh, remember the animal. And a lot of times common names are descriptive of what the animal is. So in Lookdown's case, completely. So body shape. They've kind of got like a big rhombusy body. So I'm going to start just with the body shape. And let's see. It's kind of a circle with like pointy parts and a triangle. So the back half, I'm going to say is kind of triangular shape. And the front half is like a circle with a point. So I like to do a little cross section on my animals. And this just allows me to think of the center and where things are relative to the center. But we'll go to the fins. We got some nice triangular fins. And this is a, an adult look down. On juvenile look downs, they have really long streamy tra trailery fins. Like they're, they're beautiful. And um, a few within the last year, the aquarium had juvenile look downs in one of the nursery tanks on the first floor because they have a look down breeding program. So they're actually raising, breeding and raising look downs in the aquarium. And I believe they're doing this with um, Roger Williams University. And it's really, really cool to be able to care for animals and have them reproduce and then raise them in an aquarium. Uh, it's a relatively sustainable way to have uh, animals in the aquarium and then also share with other aquariums. Okay. So the tail on this fish is really cool. It's like a very V-shaped tail. And I was talking about tail shape before, and actually, you know what? I am gonna erase that and draw it a little bit further out. And when I erase, it doesn't mean that I made a mistake. Erasing is just as important as drawing. It's just, you're letting that drawing tape sh take shape. And I think, I, like I said, the eraser is just as important part of the tool as the pencil. Um, a lot of times a V shape or a C shaped tail means the look down is, uh, or the fish in question is a fast swimmer. A V shape can usually allow you to go pretty fast. Um, paddle shaped tails, which we'll see a little later, um, can help you turn fast, like turn on a dime, but maybe might not allow you to get lots of speed. Okay, we've got kind of the gills. You want those gills in there, you gotta breathe. And let's move to mouth now. So. A lot of times when I cartoon, you know, the mouth on a look down kind of looks kind of like it's, oh, what's going on? And I spend a lot of time, I know that not you're not always supposed to like anthropomorphize or personify, personify uh, animals, but a lot of times for me, I feel like adding human-like qualities helps me convey what it's like for them. Because in my books, I like to really get the reader to think about what it's like to be an animal living in the ocean. Um, like, how would you get your food? How would you survive? So let's give this guy a pretty big eye. And I think we maybe have to have the look down looking down. Now, what I haven't told you about look downs is that you rarely ever see just one look down. They are a schooling fish. They like strength in numbers. And I really enjoy watching schooling fish. I think it's really fun to just like see uh, a group move like that through the water all together. Um, and one of the neat things, you can kind of see it on the look down. I'm not sure if you can see it in your picture, is that there's a really faint line on the look down's body. And on fish, this is called a lateral line. And a lateral line is like a thin, line on the side that has nerves that sense changes of pressure in the water. So if you're schooling together, you don't always necessarily rely on sight. You might feel a fish nearby turn in the water with your lateral line and you can know to turn with them. So it's a sensory thing that allows fish to kind of communicate with each other or, or stay in a group. And that's particularly helpful if you're going to see something like the next fish that we, we see. But let's, let's continue with our look down. And I hmm, think we're looking okay. We've got some kind of lines. And again, this is kind of like the pattern part, thinking about the lines on the fish. 
And in cartooning, I like to use something called motion lines. And motion lines can indicate that something is moving. So feel free to add motion lines. Maybe this look down swimming pretty fast. We'll give it some speed lines. Roop, roop. And look there. And instead of drawing a whole bunch of look downs, I'm just gonna do maybe a tiny one. And sometimes this helps me when I'm having a hard time with a fish's body shape, I'll draw just the silhouette. And what I'm doing anytime I draw animals in the ocean or just draw in general is I'm, I'm drawing my version of something. So it's, I'm trying to make it feel like it's inspired by the real thing, but it's not exactly the real thing. So it's kind of like an interpretation or translation of reality. Um, and I, that's just what I like to do. So I think other things that you can play around with is maybe you've already drawn your character and you want to play around with expressions. And maybe this look down has just seen the next animal that we're going to draw. We'll get us Gala. Oh no. Oh no. This is why we school. This is why we school. This is why we do it. So rest assured this look down has a good strategy of hanging out with its buddies but we're gonna draw a predator it might encounter in the wild, and that is a great barracuda. So barracudas are basically just a torpedo-shaped mass of muscle. They're incredibly fast when they wanna catch their prey. Usually when I see barracudas when I'm diving, they're totally just chilling. They're like hanging out on top of the reef, just looking around. Sometimes they hang out under a dive boat. I'm just like, hey, barracuda, what's up? And they're like, what's up? So. The first thing for a barracuda, and again, body shape. They're basically just like, I don't want to call them a sausage, because they're not like a sausage, but they're tubular. And I will mention that right now I'm drawing uh, in not my most preferred way. I'm using a tablet and drawing on the computer so I can share this with you. Well, my favorite way to draw is actually with a pencil and paper. It's just a lot harder to get a, a good setup for that so when you see me drawing some squiggles it's a little it's a little different for me to draw this way than the way i normally draw we've got a torpedo shaped body very pointy triangle so we got a triangle on one end and their torpedo shaped body kind of tapers on that side and again just the body shape alone is a hint this fish can go fast and tail wise we've got kind of a wider v so i'm just going to start with almost like the letter d but I noticed in the back, it kind of tapers in a little bit. So cut a little triangle out of there. And then we'll look at our other fins. So we've got a wee dorsal fin in the top. And then we've got a slightly larger one in the back. And again, just triangles attached to a sausage. Barracuda would probably be like, I'm more of the triangles attached to a sausage. Um, one of the other things I would like to mention is that if anybody has questions during this time, please feel free to ask those via the Facebook page and um, they'll get to me and I'll answer them to the best of my ability. And they can be questions about art. They can be questions about science, um, whatever, whatever floats your boat, no pun intended. Um, so yeah, just feel free to reach out and ask and I'd be happy to, happy to answer. I feel like that one's maybe a little bit more pointy. So we'll make that Okay, let's go to our eyes. This guy's got pretty big eyes. And I kind of just want to make the barracuda looking right out at us. And they also have kind of a mouth that I feel like is a little, let's see. It just kind of looks a little unhappy. Well, maybe we'll. Maybe Barracuda. Barracuda likes Fridays. Barracuda's like me. The first mouth was a Monday mouth. This mouth is a Friday mouth. Again, I feel like a lot of times part of my drawing is me be like being silly, but a lot of times that helps me stay engaged with what I'm drawing. Um, sometimes it does kind of feel like magic when you're just like, I started with a blank page and now there's a drawing there. At the same time, uh, some of y'all have probably heard, probably heard about writer's block. Um, I write and I draw and I have to say I sometimes have days where I get drawer's block or writer's block. I've had days where I wake up and I'm like, I just can't draw today. Nothing seems like it's coming out right. And that's okay to have days like that. 
it's okay to not feel like you can be the best that you can be every single day. And sometimes I'll try and push through and see if I can, if I can, you know, get better. Or, but other times if I can't, I will literally take a break. I will go for a walk. I'll see what else I have to do on my to-do list. Um, and if there's something that's maybe like answering emails or writing something, sometimes if I can't draw, I write. And if I'm feeling like I can't write, I draw. So it's nice to have those like comforting activities. And sometimes I, sometimes I just can't. And a lot of times I'll turn to a book that I find inspirational. So maybe I'll just go and look at uh, even a, like one of the guidebooks that I have. Okay, so we've got our Barracuda. I noticed that there are some spots on the side on our Barracuda. So that is another indicator. And the same things that I'm looking at to help me draw this Barracuda would be the exact same things that I would be looking at on a dive if I needed to identify animals. Um, I am not a scientist by trade, but I have participated in reef surveys. Um, and reef surveys are basically you go down with a dive slate and identify stuff. Uh, so I would basically count the amount of species that I found. In order to do that, you have to be okay with trying to identify stuff. So you're looking at the same exact things we're looking at when we draw to identify animals. And if anybody's interested in doing things like that, there's lots of citizen science things just in our local area. And I know we're on Facebook, so you might be tuning in from all over. But if you're interested in, in doing um, population surveys of local animals, check out local resources. I know museums and zoos and aquariums will often have links to them. And it's really cool. It might be a backyard bird count. Um, I know, I don't know if Cornell st still does it, but for those of you who live in cities or um, places where there's pigeons, uh, which would be me, I'm not a pigeon. I live in a place where there's pigeons. Uh, they were doing like a pigeon count for a long time where you like observed a pigeon and marked down what it's uh, like, what it's coloration was. And you could report back on that pigeon. And it was a really cool way of just doing citizen science, which is you don't have to be a scientist, but you can collect data that can actually help scientists um, do, do work. So I mentioned that barracuda is like the hangout above the reef. And I think for the sake of letting us know that our look down got away okay, and I'm doing this just because it's, oh, hold on, copy, going to paste, we'll have our little friend down here, and what do you think, happy end for the, uh, for the look down? I'm going to flip it. There you go, little buddy. You get away. Phew. Um, one of the joys of, of doing this. So are there any questions so far that anybody has? Um. So we have one from Christina who asked, how does the aquarium prevent uh, eating of other living fish in the big ocean tank? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so yeah, there's over a thousand different animals living in the giant ocean tank. And part of how the aquarium prevents uh, nibbling and snacking is that all these animals get fed and the divers and aquarists know who needs what to eat. So in that tank, you have herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. You have animals that some eat like uh, vegetables and some eat other animals. So the larger predators are getting target fed for the most part. So that means that they might be individually offered food by a diver. So if you're a loggerhead sea turtle, um, the diver might be going down with um, a little rod that they can put uh, fish or squid at the end of and offer that to the turtle. If it's a green sea turtle like Myrtle, she gets fed a couple times a day and she'll get things like uh, Brussels sprouts and cabbage and lettuce. Uh, and Sometimes that's also to prevent her from going and stealing other animals' food because uh, we're going to be drawing angelfish next. They also get lettuce, which is kind of taking the place of seaweed or algae. And that lettuce, I've seen Myrtle steal the angelfish lettuce. I'm like, Myrtle, come on. Um, for the barracuda, they tend to hang out at the top, so they'll get offered food from the, to the top of the tank, from the platform. And the idea is that if we're giving all of the animals what they need to eat, they're going to be less inclined to uh, predate or snack on each other. And I always say that I can't give you like 100% no snacking guarantee, but essentially they're not going to be spending the energy to go catch food if they are fed. Um, so that's kind of how we regulate that. Um, one of the other things that is helpful is that the giant ocean tank for a Caribbean coral reef only has the fish and turtles in it. There's no invertebrates, there's no jellies, there's no crabs, there's no clams. And a lot of those animals would be the main prey of a, like for a shark, like the bonnet head sharks in the tank. So by not having invertebrates in the tank, it prevents further snacking, but it also makes the other animals in the tank a lot easier to care for. It'd be a lot harder to care for thousands of vertebrate, invertebrates on top of 
all of the fish and turtles that are in the tank. But yeah, it's, I mean, and it's amazing too, because you've got really small fish. So any of the fish that eat plankton, so for instance, the, um, the look downs, you basically get like, there's, um, brine shrimp and krill and small stuff like that so there's like krillsicle like a popsicle of krill that will just slowly dissolve when it's put in the tank and that will just be floating uh free floating planktonic food like plankton food for the fish to eat um but yeah it's a lot to see and i i don't i'm going to assume the aquarium's probably done some virtual visit behind the scenes food prep um and those videos might be worth checking out and Brittany, you can correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like there's been some behind the scenes like how we prepare food for different animals and it's really cool because a lot of these animals are getting um, the same food that you might get in a restaurant or you might cook at home, uh, which is kind of fun. So I, I mean, I like seafood. So it's always like, Oh, that actually looks pretty good. What they're getting. Like I'd take that shrimp any day. Like I need that calamari. Um, I guess to be fair, it's not like deep fried. It's just like raw squid. Um, but yeah, sorry, tangent. Uh, I'm going to scoot along to our next animal because I mentioned angelfish. And angelfish are predominantly herbivores. They like a lot of uh, ocean plants and algae. Uh, you might see them around the turtles sometimes in the tank, uh, using their beaks to kind of uh, nip at the turtle shell. And that's just because there might be algae growing on there. Uh, but they've got a very different body shape than what we've seen. They're a little similar to the look downs, but not really. Um, and I like to start them with just an oval. So. Uh, and one of the things that's nice about angelfish is that their body shapes are all the same, but there's a lot of different, I like to say flavors, um, a lot of different species. So the giant ocean tank has queen angelfish, gray angelfish, and French angelfish, and they all look similar except for their colors are different. So a queen angelfish has a lot of blue and yellow on it. And um, if you get a chance to look up a juvenile queen angelfish, so that's a, a young, like a kid queen angelfish, they're absolutely stunning. They've got like these electric blue stripes and you almost wouldn't think that they grow up to be what their parents look like. But a lot of younger fish have um, camouflage when they're young or different patterns when they're young that they grow out of once they're adults. And that's not just for fish. There's lots of animals that have that as well. And you think about baby birds, uh, a lot of them have like, a, you might be seeing baby robins around. A lot of them have dots and speckles that help them camouflage in their habitat where their parents have like the bright red bottom and the gray back. There's like baby birds everywhere right now. It's pretty exciting to, I'm a bird watcher as well. I don't just watch fish, I watch birds too. Um, so we've got an oval shape and then really distinct triangles. And it seems like these triangles might make this fish go fast. Angelfish, if you get a chance to observe them, are not that fast. And I know the GOT, the Giant Ocean Tank, has a live video feed. Um, so it might be worth it afterwards if you were interested in how we do this, uh, this drawing along. You can go and like watch the video feed. Now I'll say, it's a lot harder to draw a fish when it's moving than it is from a photo. So when I when I would go to the aquarium to draw at the to draw by observation, you have to draw a lot faster, and you have to like your brain has to go like, okay, it was an oval with triangles, and it had like a pointy mouth, and that's that's it. So it's a lot it's a lot um it's a lot faster drawing unless you find someone who's just chilling like a sleeping turtle, and then you can spend some time with them. So we've got the oval on the front. They've got a little bit of a, a pointy part, so kind of attach a, a little triangle on there, and then we've got the tail. We have a very paddle-shaped tail for this friend. And the other two fish we saw was like a V or a C-shaped. A paddle-shaped tail usually means that you can turn on a dime like quickly, like you can turn your body around quickly and you can maneuver fast, but you might not be able to swim away that fast. Um, angelfish are pretty good at swimming fast when they need to. But a lot of times the tail, the fins and the tail shape can tell you about what their behavior might be in the reef. So if I'm an animal that scrapes algae off the rocks, I probably want to be strong enough to hold myself in a current, but also I want to be able to hold myself in a place for a long time and kind of maneuver. And it'd be easier for an oval flat shaped fish to do that than a long skinny fish. Okay, fins on the side, we need those pectoral fins. And I usually do the pectoral fins and the gills at the same time because they're often connected. So let's get let's get our little fin up there. And we'll go to mouth and eyes. So and I think this friend would like some algae to munch on. And 
Uh, if you were with us last week, we did parrotfish, and parrotfish have a beak-shaped mouth, and angelfish have a mouth um, similar to that as well. They, it's kind of rounded at the top, and it looks a lot kind of like a like a bird beak. And again, it's just because they use their mouth for scraping algae and stuff off of rocks. So this is where I, you know, I was starting with sh simple shapes, and then I kind of hone in and think about, okay, well, I had drawn a triangle, but right now we've got kind of a half circle right here and another triangle down there for the mouth. Um, and just as humans as a species, we tend to focus a lot on the faces of other, obviously other humans, but also other animals. So in my drawings, I might spend a lot more time on the eyes and mouth and head part of an animal than I do on, say, the tail or one of the fins, because that's the part that we're going to be looking at, especially if I'm using it to tell a story. And you know what, in this case, I actually think that, and I'm going to, I'm doing this digitally so I can do this easily instead of erasing. I think I want to move this closer. And this is one of the benefits of working digitally is that sometimes if you need to, you can move parts around on a drawing. Um, and if you were doing it on uh, paper, it would be erasing. Or one of the things when I see people doing development drawings, especially in animation, is a lot of times they'll just take a post-it and stick it right on top and redraw on top of the post-it. And that's fine to do too. Again, like I'm doing this for fun to learn about these animals. Um, so there's no like, again, there's no like right or wrong way to make your drawings. And you could be drawing along today. You could be doing a sculpture if you wanted to. You could do this with Play-Doh um, and you could use the same principles. You could look at the body shape and you could be working in 3D. Cause so, honestly, sometimes some people, uh, it's easier for them to make art if it's hand, more hands-on and more three-dimensional. And you could be finger painting these. Honestly, if you wanted to sit here and look at the picture of the fish and write a haiku, that's still a way to engage with science and the natural world and make art from it. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to like participate and have fun today. Um, maybe you are writing a play about the fish that we're drawing. Um, and that's when behavior kind of comes into it. Like what's the story that you can tell about this fish? So I'm kind of looking at my, looking at my shapes and the reason why I did the hatches on here is because when you look at the scales on angelfish, they kind of look like little crisscrosses. Um, and cartooning for me is a lot of times I don't have to draw the whole thing. It doesn't have to look exactly like it does in, in real life. But I'm thinking about how I can use the scales to give you a sense of the fact that their bodies aren't completely flat. There's a little bit of roundness happening. And then the pattern on here is queen angelfish have a little dot up here that kind of radiates out another color. And this is a situation where color would be incredibly helpful for both identifying the fish and drawing the fish so that people knew it was a um, queen angel fish. And they've got, so this is, this is, and I maybe will do color sometime, but I think it's a little, a little tricky to do color. Or maybe every time today, maybe I'll go back to one of these drawings and put some color on top. Um, I think we should draw some rocks with some algae on here because, ooh, algae. And I mentioned that I like to do comics. So a lot of times I'll have the fish saying something um, to indicate why they're excited. So, ooh, algae feels like the kind of thing that I would yell on a Friday morning and be like, yeah, algae. And I think I got the spelling right on there. That's the other thing is like, I know I'm a writer, but like everybody, I use, you know, I use the internet or dictionaries to help make sure that my writing is correct. So apologies if I spell anything wrong today. I tried to, anything I did beforehand, I could double check, but if I do it live, it's a little tricky. Um, any other questions that anybody has? Sure, so we have a few from a couple of our young viewers. Um, so Dahlia, who's eight years old, says, I love to draw. When did you start drawing? So I started drawing as soon as I could hold a crayon or a pencil. So probably around the age of like two or three. And, um, one of the things that I like to mention is that my mom recognized that I really liked drawing, even as a really young kid. So she just always made sure that there was paper and pencils and crayons around because when I... I never really got bored because I was the kind of kid that could just like go off for hours and just look at a book or draw and be completely happy with that. Um, if my sister, if she's watching, was not always the same way. So it, it's not, it's for every kid, it's different. Um, sometimes we need a lot more stuff going on to like, to do things. But um, having 
both a family and teachers that recognized that I really liked the draw and that drawing was helpful helped encourage me early on. And I think for a lot of artists or people who continue to draw their whole lives, that encouragement was really important. So yeah, I started young, but I also had grownups that recognized that I liked to draw and they, they made sure that when I, when I, when I could, I could draw. Um, I will say that, uh, Sometimes I would get in trouble in school for drawing because a lot of times my mind would wander. Um, but by the time I got to middle school and high school, I realized that if I could uh, draw in my notes, especially for math and science class, it actually helped me remember. And science is pretty visual. So I would draw a lot in my science notes to help me. So I have like, if you, if I can pull them out. I have for my chemistry homework when I was in high school, I have little drawings of like atoms and molecules talking about what they do and like how chemical reactions happen. So this is kind of the way that my brain has worked since I was a kid. And if you're a kid watching this, you might be like, oh my gosh, that's totally how my brain works. A lot of times I see cartoons or stories in my head and that's what helps me remember stuff. And that is like completely okay and awesome. Um, figuring out how you learn best is really helpful because I struggled a lot with reading and writing when I was in middle school and high school. Um, so hands-on stuff and things where there was lots of pictures or if I could draw helped me learn better, um, but it didn't. It actually took me until my 20s to realize that that was how I learned best uh, when I started working with kids myself in, in my 20s. But yeah, draw on anything that you can. I mean, not like the walls or anything, but say you're into doing big drawings. Parents, if you can get like um, big pieces of paper and even like, uh, I would draw a lot on uh, the cardboard, not cardboard, uh, brown paper bags. So if you want to do a big drawing, uh, put up like cut up some brown paper bags and put them on a wall and you can do a big mural. It's okay to work big, just, you know, Make sure you have permission to go draw and stuff. Same thing with sidewalk chalk. That's another thing I love to draw with because you get to go outside and draw really big. And then it's kind of cool that it gets washed away. Like I like that it's not permanent. It's like a, I don't know. It's, it's like, it just exists in the moment. Well, that is awesome. Um, another question from Eleanor asks, does a barracuda have sharp skin like a shark? Oh, does it have sharp skin like a shark? So barracuda, I think, are covered in scales, so different different than sharks. And we'll talk about shark skin when we get to the next animal. So I believe they're 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 kind of smooth and and slippery, much like other fish. And it depends. It's, some fish do have like pokey bits, like a um, porcupine fish. But yeah, I don't. I do not think that they have rough skin. I think they're a lot more smooth. And I don't know if they're. So a lot of fish with scales are also covered in a thin layer of mucus. I learned this when I was a little kid fishing for the first time in freshwater, and I, would, I usually just caught pumpkin seed sunfish, but I remember the first time I ever touched a fish when I was taking the hook out, and I'm like, oh, you're really slimy. And a lot of animals in the ocean, whether they're fish or invertebrates, do use mucus on the outside to protect themselves. It helps them from uh, getting scratches on the outside. And I don't know if barracuda have a lot of slime, but for sure I think they're a lot, they're a lot more smooth. Um, but great question, because a lot of times they're even if um, even if animals are, are predators, they a lot of times share a lot of similar characteristics. Now, I tried to draw a, a pair of uh, angelfish from the side and you'll notice it's a little trickier when you start to think of fish in 3D. They look a little a little silly, um, but that's a good challenge for your brain. And one of the things that I do, even though I draw two dimensionally, is that I actually have a whole bunch of like toys hanging around and these are really helpful like say I wanted to draw and we're going to be doing a bonnet head next say I wanted to draw a bonnet head shark from below like I'm a fish looking up or draw it from above like I'm a seabird looking down or even a diver I can take a toy and move it to however I need and this is how a lot of artists work even if you're working on fiction uh I know a lot of people who work on superhero comics and they use like little models and when they need to draw a city they'll use google earth or um and to look at like what a city looks like. So using reference is kind of a fundamental part for a lot of artists to make a place that's realistic. But yeah, if you have any ocean animals or just like say there's an animal you're interested in, if you have any toys or stuffed animals, those are great things to use as models for drawing those, those animals. Okay, I think it's time for our next animal and more questions are welcome as well. So I'll we'll leave the queen angelfish behind. Oh, I forgot about this. One of the things I oh, do with, uh, if an animal has something in their common name that could maybe help me remember them, I might give them a crown because this is a queen angelfish. 
And I feel like that's just a way for me to be a little silly, but it might actually help someone remember what type of animal it is. I do this with the queen conch too, which is um, conchs, queen conchs are like a really big snail that you might find in the sandy bottom. Um, so I'm just gonna give this friend a little crown with some nice gems because that just seems like the right thing to do. Um, all hail queen angelfish, majestic algae eater of the moderately deep. They're kind of like shallow to middle, middle deep. Throw a little sparkles on there. This is your sparkles. Okay, now we'll go to the shark snacks. Um, so there is a species of shark in the giant ocean tank. That's the bonnethead shark. And the shark that I was showing you just a second ago, this little friend, is a hammerhead. And bonnetheads are a small type of hammerhead shark. So forgive me while I get my, my little book so I can have my picture open as well. We'll talk about shark bodies in general and specifically draw a bonnet head. And then maybe we might talk about some other sharks because I don't know if you noticed, I like to dress up for this. I'm wearing my shark shirt again because whenever possible, I try and thematically match my presentations. So sharks are another type of animal that for the most part have a pretty torpedo shaped body. Their body is long and slender. Um, not as much as the barracuda. They're not like a complete tube or cylinder. But for most sharks, I start their bodies like that. And you'll notice that a lot of my animals I'll be doing from the side. That's usually the drawing that I start with first. And that helps me think about them. But we're, we're going to draw the bonnet head from a couple different angles. But the side view will help us first. So torpedo shaped body. The head is important. Now from the side, it's kind of tricky because the cephalofoil, the part that's the part that is that hammerhead shaped, or in this case, it's kind of round, um, is part of sensory for the shark. We talk about lateral lines in the look downs, but in bonnet heads, they have this part that allows them to sense electrical impulses underwater. And if you look at lots of different types of sharks up close, and I didn't get a picture of this, but you can, you can Google this. They have lots of tiny pores, like little tiny dots all over their face. And a lot of times on a couple other sensory parts of their body, um, like their snout. And those are the ampullae of Lorenzini. You don't have to remember that term, but they are little pores and they are special nerves that uh, there's jelly in there as well. And the nerves allow them to sense weak electrical impulses in the water. Now, every time our heart beats, it's beating through electricity. So bonnethead sharks might be looking for animals and sensing their, their living bodies under the water or under the sand. These guys like to eat crabs. So, they're looking for, and when I say looking, kind of sensing for, feeling for things they might want to eat. And that's part of the reason why they have that big part of the front. It's like specialized for sensory, sensory feeling. Now the eyes, we're gonna have one little eye on the side. Right now it kind of looks like a vacuum cleaner, but the shark doesn't know that because they don't know what vacuum cleaners are. They're just like, hey, why'd you call me a weird appliance that sucks up dirt? I don't know what those are. I live in the ocean. I don't need to worry about vacuum cleaners. Um, lots of triangles going on for sharks. Uh, so we've got dorsal fin on the back. We just did the pectoral fin down there. I'm going to see if we can see our gill slits. And I actually think I drew the body not wide enough. So I'm going to adjust my line here. Now sharks have gill slits, which is a thing that makes them a little different. So we've talked about bony fish today. All of the fish I've drawn up into the shark have been bony fish. Um, sharks and rays are cartilaginous fish, which basically just means instead of bones for their skeleton, they have cartilage. So it's, uh, their skeleton feels a lot like the tip of your nose or your ears. Um, but another thing that makes sharks different is they have gill slits instead of one big gill covering that fish have. So most sharks have five gill slits on either side. Now there are some shark species called the six gill shark and the seven gill shark. You can probably guess how many gill slits they have. Um, and then there's also some species of shark where the last two gill slits kind of fuse together and look like one. So on nurse sharks, it kind of looks like they have four. Um, and then there's some other sharks, I didn't talk about this with the Kano's rays, that will have another hole that helps them breathe called, uh, oh man, I'm drawing a blank on this one. Not an operculum. Uh, but basically it's another thing. So if you're an animal like a ray that spends a lot of time on the sand, you might get sand on your gills because they're on the bottom. So you have another um, special hole in the back that helps uh, push water over your gills so you can you can breathe. So let's see. We've got another fin down here and another fin up top. 
and we need our tails. So again, we see this V-shaped tail, and this is a good indicator that this shark is a pretty fast swimmer. Now, bonnet heads might be schooling around the reef, uh, so they might hang out with a couple different, couple different sharks. But like I said, their primary source of food is crabs, so they're going to be wanting to go down to the bottom where it might be sandy or sandy and rocky combined and look for those crabs. And they might eat mollusks as well, so clams, snails, my favorite animal. Um, so I'm not supposed to pick favorite, favorite favorites, but I really do love snails. And I think it's hard to sometimes get a sense of what their, their body would look like. And I think that's okay for the head. And we'll do a little bit of an indication of a lateral line. So sharks also have lateral lines. And a little bit of that, and I'll raise some lines up here. So right now we can't see their mouth. And I told you we kind of like pay attention to um, a lot of times their face. So I want to pick an angle, and I think the photo matches this better. I think there's two photos. One of them's like an undershot. So let's see if we can draw the shark from underneath. And I think that will, it's going to be a little trickier, but that will help. And I think in this case, I might actually use my toy because I don't have the same picture that you have. So. Let's think about their body and how they're not just straight like this. They can sometimes move around. So if you want to draw something in that space, maybe it starts to look a little bit like a banana. Who you call it a banana? I'm a shark. I'm like, well, they also don't know what bananas are, so that's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry, bonnethead shark. It's okay to look like a banana. And we'll get the cephalofoil up there. And again, the cephalofoil is kind of just like a half circle right there and I'm going to do and I didn't do the for the bottom one I'm going to draw a little guideline to show me down the bottom and this is a little a little different so right now I'm thinking about the animal in three dimensions so I'm going to draw kind of like if you saw a cross section I'm going to draw two of these here and this is just going to help me place the fins so we're going to have one triangular shaped fin here And another one there. Oh, I, I like this friend right now. This is exciting. And what you can't see from the bottom drawing is that there's actually two fins on each side. So um, working with a toy will allow you, or a model, or even watching a video will actually help you to um, see kind of completely what the shark looks like. And we've got one down there. And I think the dorsal fin here, and this is, again, this is where I'm using my, like, spatial brain my brain's really trying to think of the shark in three dimensions even though i'm still cartooning um so this would be a little bit more advanced but still kind of a fun thing a fun thing to get your brain to do i'm going to get that tail and the tail hasn't changed very much um i think the I, the one of the photos on there is taken by keith ellenbogen and he did some really cool videography of these sharks moving in slow motion and that might be a really cool video to look up i can't remember if it's on the aquariums website or via one of his other things. But if we can find a, a link to that, that might be cool. Because his video is the animal still moving, but in slow motion. So that might allow you, if you're really interested in the drawing part, not just to see the animal's body shape, but you can actually see muscle movement, which is a really, really fantastic thing to see. Because it's something that we might not see with our naked eye, but using technology like slow motion photography allows us to get um, a, a really cool view. So... We still need a face on this friend, and I'm kind of saving the face for last. I'm going to erase my guidelines. Um, and sometimes when I'm sketching, I leave my guidelines just to, to show people that that's, that was the structure of the drawing. So here's one of the things that I sometimes fudge. The mouth on this shark mostly looks like that. Sometimes, don't fault me for going all Bob Ross, but sometimes I like to draw a little happy shark. I can't help it. But the eyes are still on the side. So this is a combination that I like to use where I give you a pretty realistic body, but I give you a pretty cartoony face. And I walk this tightrope all the time of giving you insp like insp uh, information that's inspired by real life, but I'm also flexing my, I always say my, my, my artistic license. I'm playing a little bit with art to draw these animals. And right now I'm just, I'm trying to look at both sides and make sure that I have it. And maybe, 
maybe we want, you know what? I think we should give this friend some teeth. These guys have pretty teeny tiny teeth. Um, and remember what I said, they like to eat crabs. So they're going to be doing a lot of crushing as well. So we'll just have some little, little indication of tiny teeth in there. Maybe I'll race a little bit and maybe we'll draw. I don't know. I think an I love crabs. Maybe they should just be telling us what they love. I love crabs. Does anybody have any questions so far? Sure. So we have a few more. Um, let's see. Christina asked, was the transition from paper to a computer challenging? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, transition to paper and digital. I still ink on paper. And a lot of times when I'm drawing, I don't want to say for fun because my job is really fun, but when I'm drawing for pleasure, like just for, for, for funsies, I keep a sketchbook. And let's see. I will. I just keep like a the size sketchbook. I'm trying to think if I have any um, good ocean animals in here. Actually, it's just Lord of the Rings characters because I <laughs> draw really silly stuff like that and slugs and stuff. But it, a lot of times it's just like little loose sketches of a drawing that I might eventually do. Um, the great thing about drawing on paper is that this will never lose its battery um, or have files corrupted. So I, I really do like that. But I realized at the end of college um, that coloring digitally, if I wanted to do comics, would be probably the best thing for me to do. So I learned Photoshop in 2003. And uh, I draw, right now I'm drawing with a Wacom tablet. So this is a stylus I draw on. It's kind of just like a mouse, but you hold it like a, a pen. Um, so I don't actually, I don't see the image on my screen. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. And I've drawn that way digitally, well, since 2003. So almost 20 years. And it took me probably six months to not want to throw the computer out the window. <laughs> Um, it was really frustrating for me because there's this learning curve. Digital drawing tools are just like learning a new tool, um, like painting or learning how to sculpt. So it was really hard for my brain to transition to digital. Aside from that, it's a lot of looking at a screen. So the fatigue of um, sitting in front of a computer screen and looking at a computer screen, those are things that I still don't care for very much, even though it's part of my job. Drawing digitally, I didn't start to do more until the last two years, and I, I, it's, I'm trying to streamline how I make comics. I still ink on paper. That's the part that I really care about. But I, um, I started drawing on an iPad probably about a year ago, and I'm still learning, and the technology's gotten better. But it's, it's just a tool, and in that case, it's a fancy tool, and it's expensive. So I always say it, especially to young artists starting out, the best thing you can do is to practice drawing on live media because it's it's accessible. It's 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 going to be there. It's going to be a lot cheaper than these tools. Um, this tablet is actually student grade, so it's the cheapest tablet, one of the cheapest tablets you can buy. I think it goes for a hundred dollars or a little less, and it's a good starting tool. And I'm a professional and I use it. Um, it's just the way that I like to work. There's no right or wrong way to work. And period. There's some artists that work fully digital and they just are comfortable that way. And that's awesome. There's some artists that work not digital at all. And that's great. It really just depends on uh, the work that you're creating and how you like to work. Uh, but I do say a lot of times people will think that digital tools will make them a better artist. Practice will make you a better artist. That's it. And if you practice digitally or practice live, that's one thing. But pr the, the main part is practice. But don't don't feel like you have to have digital tools to make art. Um, that's something that can come with come with time. And again, like it is an investment and it is expensive. And I do this for my job. So um, yeah, but yeah, it's still, still sometimes I get really frustrated at it. And like I've had files freeze and get deleted and that's, there's nothing more painful. And I save frequently and have fail safes against that. And I back up my files, but there's nothing more painful than working on a drawing for a couple hours and then having it go away. So there's a whole separate thing of like making sure that you have a good system to back up your files, whether it's cloud or external hard drive or both. Um, yeah, it's real, real talk, real talk about digital tools. <laughs> okay, I think a good question to end with from Jocelyn, she is wondering if you have to do math in your drawings. Oh, do I have to do math in my drawings? It depends on the drawing. Um, when I lay out a comics page, I'm definitely using math to get the dimensions right. And then, uh, if I'm doing a very technical drawing, so I just recently uh, had a book come out that's all about the space program and the history of women in space. And I was drawing uh, 
rockets and the space shuttle in the interior. And I use a lot of spatial math to make sure that the composition of the drawing is there. So when I say spatial math, in my head, sometimes I'll take, so in this case, I'll, I'm thinking about the, like when I drew the shark, I'm thinking about what it looks like as a cylinder or its basic shapes and how they relate to one another. So it's not unlike skills that you would use in math and engineering um, and even lab skills, uh, estimating volumes or size or space or distance. So all of those skills that I use to draw are very science and math heavy skills. They're just kind of wearing a different outfit. Um, I will also say that practically I'm working on a longer comic that's not announced yet, but it's a graphic novel about math and science and um, engineering. And that's a situation where I'm actually learning how we learn math and figuring out how to teach math via comics. So what are some visual ways that I can help teach math? So I know that's kind of a two different answers to your question, but all of the skills that I've learned as a human being have helped me to draw the way that I draw. Um, so it's kind of the same way that, and this is not exactly the, this is maybe not the same parallel, but like I'm an avid cooker and baker and I scale up and scale down recipes all the time. And those are math skills that I use to do that. And whether I'm like doing it on a piece of paper or eyeballing it, those are two very valid, um, skills to practice. Uh, and I, yeah, I never thought about it until recently. I was talking with some engineer friends and we have a lot of things in common for how we approach, uh, designing a page in comics and efficiency and this gets to like I'm thinking more like circuit boards and stuff but part of how I draw is about efficiency when I make a comic I want the story to read as clear as possible so there are design elements that I use so for instance when I'm making comics for an English language audience we read the English language left uh, sorry left to right top to bottom so when you put word balloons on a page if you're making a comic if you want them to read in the correct order or the intended order, you should be making them uh, in order of importance, left to right, top to bottom. And it's something that you kind of take for granted until you think about how we take in information and then you're like, oh my gosh. So just the same way that drawing is a technical skill, design and designing comics and writing comics or even animation, um, or if you're interested in film, there's a, a, a language and a kind of agreed upon set of rules that we use to tell a story visually. Um, and if anybody's interested in any of this stuff, kind of thinking about comics uh, as a storytelling tool, there. So on June 6th, I'm going to be doing a panel that's part of like a day long comics thing uh, that's about space comics. But we're going to be talking about science and how science inspires comics. So there's a lot of really cool virtual things that are going on right now. If you're interested in what we did today, um, I'm going to be doing this for the whole month of June on the Aquarium's Facebook page. So tune in every Fridays at 11 a.m. Um, we're going to be drawing different animals that can be found at the aquarium. And then I'll probably pepper in some animals that I've seen on my travels. I've had the incredible pleasure and privilege to travel to some really cool places on this planet to observe animals and work with scientists to communicate their science. So uh, please tune in for that. And then I, I know we have a little bit of time left. If there's any more questions, I'm gonna draw one more shark while we while we wrap it up, if that sounds good. But uh, for thank you all of you for tuning in because um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I think, I think I'm gonna go, what kind of shark do I wanna do? I think I'm gonna do a little shark. And I know people are always like, draw a big shark. But I'm thinking about the Shark and Ray Tetch Tank and there are some sharks in there called epaulette sharks. And epaulette sharks are benthic, which means they hang out on the bottom. So their body shape is still sharky. It's got kind of that long kind of uh, cylindrical body, but they have a much longer curling tail. that's a lot more flappy. And the coolest part about them is that their fins kind of hug the bottom of the ocean floor and are almost like paddles. And my favorite thing about them is that these sharks kind of walk. When they want to move around, they actually move their body a little bit like a, um, a salamander to go across. And they actually can go in tide pools. They're Pacific animals. Um, they can go like travel a little bit across land to get into different like tide pools to go hang out in. And I just think it's really cool because there's so much incredible diversity in the animal world. So my thing is like, if there's an animal that you're interested in, say maybe you're just interested in like great white sharks, deep dive and learn about all the different types of sharks because there's, you know, deep sea sharks and um, tropical sharks. And it kind of, it kind of like, I think about animals as gateway animals. If there's an animal that you love, um, learn as much as you can, not just about that animal, 
but about like all the ones it's related to. And I feel like you can really find some cool um, inspiration. Uh, and a lot of times I rely on um, aquarium websites and, you know, National Geographic websites. Um, and then the other thing that I do is if there's any scientists that do outreach um, and they have resources, a lot of times I'll try and find what they do. And sometimes they have some really neat, um, really neat uh of resources available. Um, so I try and follow as many scientists as I can on Twitter and Instagram. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. So if you're interested in, I try and retweet them. Um, I'm at Maris Wicks on both Instagram and Twitter. Um, if you're interested in also supporting the aquarium, uh, these are some trying times now. And if you have the ability to do so, uh, please support the aquarium. There's a donate button just to um, help keep these awesome resources and institutions going. Uh, because right now the best way to connect with them is online doing things like this. And if you can't, that's okay. Just tuning in today is help enough and sharing what you love about the ocean is, is awesome too. I think any, any little bit helps, whether it's sharing something that you love, um, you know, being like, Hey, you want to come do this live draw or all the other awesome live chat and virtual visits the aquarium has been doing. It's a really great way to see what the aquarium does behind the scenes and also get in touch with the scientists that work at the aquarium as well. I know they've been doing Q and A's um, cause the aquarium does support science, not just in the U S but throughout the world for ocean conservation and ocean research. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, I don't know if there's any last minute questions or if I should uh, keep drawing and just wrap it up. I don't, any other questions? Okay, then I'll wrap it up. Thank you all so much. I really hope you had a good time today. Oh, and please share your drawings with me. Again, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I would love to see them. Um, I think we're working at maybe sharing them at the next live chat. So if you want to see your drawings featured on this, that would be super cool. Um, I would love to share the artwork that you're creating. Um, and again, it doesn't even have to be a drawing. It could be a haiku. It could be a sculpture. And maybe maybe we'll get into some different mediums um, for some of these and really really get our creative juices going. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. It was lovely to see you all today and, uh, have a great Friday and a great weekend. Bye everybody.